All right, it is 9.30. We're going to go ahead and get started. If you have your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 9. We're going to wrap up Acts chapter 9 and move into Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. So I have some lofty goals today. We're going to see if we can get uh, Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 completed today. If you have a workbook, uh, open it up to lesson number 8. That's going to be page number 15. There are copies in the foyer of the, of the lessons what we're doing, we're going through a survey of the book of Acts uh, this quarter on Sundays. Wednesdays, we're going through the book of Psalms. And so we are going back and forth with our, uh, with our Bible classes. I know we have guests here. Thank you for being here with us today. Hope and pray that you can be with us uh, all day. We may, be, may even have some uh, watching via live stream. And we've got a lot of people away on vacation and traveling. That's all right. We'll continue on with, uh, with our studies here and, uh, and our worship. So thank you for being here. A couple of uh, action items number, uh, real quickly before we dive into the lesson. Uh, let's remember we have uh, our VBS uh, coming up here soon next month. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit becoming more like Christ. Our theme here is becoming more like Christ. So let's be sure that we, um, we get our children here for those series of lessons. And let's also uh, use this as an opportunity to invite people uh, to come and study the Word of God. And as always, I'm going to say something about the cards. Uh, whether you're here locally, uh, Ken's laughing at me, or whether you're watching via live stream on vacation, get some of these cards out, all right? Let's invite people. Let's open up our eyes, our mouth, our Bibles. Let's talk to people. Let's study uh, study with others from the Word of God. We have a number we need to be praying for. Uh, let's continue to be praying for the uh, the Enoch family at this time. And let's also be praying for uh, Dane's friend. I, I believe his name was John. Uh, an email was sent out. Is that, is that correct, brother? John, okay. And then, um, and then we also need to be praying for uh, Ken and Norma Jean. I just want to say real quickly here uh, that I love Ken and Norma Jean very much. These last three months have been great. Uh, just being able to get to know you two and to uh, and to work together. So appreciate you guys. Love you guys very much and the work that you guys have done here. Uh, let's continue to pray for them and the great work that they're going to continue to do. This is uh, their last Sunday here. I know Ken's going to have some more to say this morning in his sermon. But I uh, just want you guys to know that. Appreciate you guys and the things you've done for us here. All right. I think those are all of the, the things I wanted to mention up front. Let's begin with prayer and then we'll do a quick review And we'll see if we can get through Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. Let's pray. Holy God, we are so thankful that we can approach your throne of grace. We're thankful, Lord, that we know that you hear our prayers. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that you love us so much. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you give to us. And thank you, God, that we can know that we are your children. We thank you, Lord, for the word that has been preserved for us. Help us, Lord, to hide it into our hearts. Help us, Lord, to allow it to be a lamp unto our feet. Help us, Lord, to... Uh, love it, to rejoice with the guidance that it provides for us on a daily basis. Be with us, Lord, as we go through the book of Acts. Help us, Lord, to have the same courage and boldness that the apostles and the disciples had in the first century. And help us, Lord, never to be ashamed of who you are. We recognize, Lord, that the gospel has the power to continue to save souls. And so we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to share that at this time. Be with all of those, Lord, who are hurting at this time. Give them comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so with every class, we quickly want to run through and uh, just recall some basic things that we've been studying. So I'm going to ask you guys to help me out here real quickly. Uh, Acts chapter 1, what comes to mind in Acts chapter 1? We've already looked at Acts chapter 1. How would you summarize it? One or two sentences or one one or two words, actually. Go ahead. The ascension of Christ, yeah. So we saw the ascension of Christ. Uh, We saw the promise of the Holy Spirit with respect to the apostles. Acts chapter 2, what are you going to say about Acts chapter 2? I heard Pentecost. That's right. What about Acts chapter 3? The name of the man. The healing of the lame man. Good. What about Acts chapter 4? Uh, okay. Arrest or persecution. Good. Acts chapter 5. I think we all got Acts chapter 5. That couple no one wants to be like, right? Who? Ananias and Sapphira, right? They lied and they died. <laughs> That's not really funny, but it is kind of funny. Acts chapter 5, so the church discipline. Acts chapter 6. Uh, Acts chapter 6, you've got to say it loud. Yes, problem in the church, excellent, yes, uh, the needy widows, right? And Stephen and uh, seven men total were appointed by the, uh, by the brethren, good, Acts chapter 7. The, the stoning of Stephen, excellent, the stoning of Stephen, the teaching of Stephen, uh, his sermon, Acts chapter 8. 
The saints were scattered. Excellent. Yeah, there's a lot in Acts chapter 8. The saints were scattered. We have Philip going to Samaria and proclaiming the gospel. Simon the sorcerer was converted. We have Philip going uh, and speaking with the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. So we find a lot of these conversion stories. Really going back to Acts chapter 2. Remember Acts 1 and verse 8. That's really a nice launching pad for the book of Acts, right, with the gospel and how it's going to be spread uh, to the rest of the world. It's going to begin in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and then to the rest of the world. Acts chapter 9, I just put it up there. Good, Paul's conversion. And so that's where we left off this past week. So let's go look back real quickly here, and I mean quickly. In Acts chapter 9, we see uh, the biggest, really a, maybe the biggest threat to the church. It was Paul in Acts 9 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing, and leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. Come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So we ended somewhere around there, and we see Paul had this encounter with Jesus. This would have been uh, a shocking experience for for Saul, who would become Paul. Uh, This was the one that he was uh, going against. Uh, He was going against the very people of of Christ. Earlier in Acts chapter 9, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Paul was persecuting the people of God. And so Jesus, that language is powerful. He He was going against Christ. And so Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. Uh, Certainly this was to help him to see that indeed Jesus uh, was resurrected, that he's uh, reigning in heaven. Paul's going to become an apostle. Uh, He's going to be on the same level as all the other apostles. I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, or chapter 13 that talks about that he was uh, on the same level as all the other apostles. And so this is going to change a lot of things. Now, Paul was not saved right then and there on the road to Damascus. We all are on the same page with that. Everybody agree with that? As he's praying uh, for a number of days, as we saw, for he is praying in verse number 11. He wasn't saved at that point either. We get down uh, later on in chapter 9. Uh, Ananias is going to come to him. Uh, he's going to regain his sight. In verse 18, he got up and was baptized. He took food and was strengthened. When you couple that with Acts 22 and verse 16, where Paul is rehearsing his conversion story, he said, uh, he, re- he told his audience what Ananias said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so uh, Paul was going to be saved or was saved just like everyone else was uh, in the first century. So this is a very important shift Uh, in the book of Acts. We've seen uh, persecution. We've seen some problems within the local church. The brethren are now scattered in Acts chapter 8. Now Paul, one of the biggest enemies of God's people, he is now converted. And I want you to notice in verse number 19, it says, now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. So immediately after his conversion, what does he do? Uh, He's aligning himself up with other people of God, something very important for us, great application for us. After a person is converted, uh, they need to to be with other Christians. They need to be aligned with other saints, disciples, uh, in in a geographical location. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. Why would that be such a shock to the people? Paul is now in the synagogues proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. It's because... Go ahead. Yeah, he was persecuting the way, and he was going after these individuals. And so that's the response of the people. Look at verse 21. All those hearing him continue to be amazed and were saying, is, that, is, not, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? 
But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. That's a theme that we find all throughout the book of Acts. Jesus of Nazareth, he is the Christ, all right? He's the anointed one, the Messiah. And so uh, just like the other apostles, as Paul is preaching, what's going to happen to him? What would you say? Yeah, opposition is going to come his way, right? He's going to be persecuted, and that's exactly what we find in verse 23. The Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. And so Paul, uh, he would escape, and he would go to Jerusalem. What happened in Jerusalem when he tried to align himself with the disciples? What was the response? I heard something. What? They refrained? Yeah. Uh, No, thank you. No, you stay outside. You're not coming in here. His reputation. Everybody knew him. Everybody knew what he had done. He was was all over the place. Uh, And quite naturally, I think that's maybe normal that there was some fear. Is this actually real? Has he truly been converted? converted? So who would assist him along the way? Barnabas. And so we're introduced to Barnabas back in Acts chapter 4, right? The son of encouragement. Uh, We're going to find Barnabas again in Acts chapter 11. Uh, We're going to find Barnabas again in Acts chapter 15, Galatians. Uh, Barnabas is going to be mentioned throughout the New Testament. And so uh, Barnabas took hold of him, verse number 27, and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. I want to also show you guys or or just make a quick mention here. Verse 26, uh, we got to give Paul credit. He was trying to associate with the disciples. Christianity is not to be done by, by ourselves, okay? Um, and th- this happens sometimes. So if you decide to move away sometime or whatever, you need to align yourself, associate yourself with other Christians. Uh, this mindset, well, I can just kind of float along and I don't really need to place membership here or there, that's not really going to work. And sometimes uh, Christians do that uh, because, honestly, they don't really want to be under the oversight of elders. And so just kind of move along and things like that. Paul was associating himself with the disciples. And so that's just something good for us. And even with our children, when they go off to college, they need to align themselves with the local congregation. Uh, They need that support. We need that support. And so that's what we find Paul, whether he was in Damascus, whether he was in Jerusalem, when he goes to Antioch with Barnabas in Acts chapter 11, uh, they're they're with other Christians, all right? Uh, So what we find here is this transition. Verse 31, what took place amidst, uh, in the midst of the churches? There was something that uh, the churches certainly needed in verse 31. They would now have some, some peace. And maybe that peace was a result of Paul being converted. He's the one bringing so much opposition. And now for a period of time, they have peace. And so there's great things that were taking place. I think there's something powerful there for us. Churches are going to go through difficult days if the church in Jerusalem went through difficult days, we are naive to think that we're never going to have some difficult days, okay? Every congregation, there's no perfect church. Every local congregation is going to have some difficult days. The good news is that we can also have peace. And sometimes that opposition from the outside is the reason of not having peace. And sometimes it can be from, from the inside. So we need to make sure that we're doing our part and listening to the words of the Holy Spirit. So when you get to, uh, go, to back, go back to verse number 28, look what Paul's doing. He's moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. He's talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews. Paul was a Hellenistic Jew. Uh, this was perfect. He was a, this chosen vessel. He's going to go in there. Uh, and he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna talk to them. Jesus is the Christ. The, natu- uh, the, the response that they had, they were attempting to put him to death. And, and so that's what we find time and time again. So it's interesting because we're introduced to Saul or Paul in Acts chapter 9. And then what Luke is going to do, he's going to introduce us back to or reintroduce Peter in Acts chapter 10 and 11. But then after that, the focus really turns to uh, Paul. And, uh, and so just kind of be prepared for that in the, in the next few weeks. Now, there are a couple of miracles that we need to discuss real quickly here in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, and if you go back to uh, lesson number 7 here, uh, questions 13 and 14, uh, quickly someone give me, uh, summarize the two miracles. What was the first miracle that took place, the latter part of Acts chapter 9? Uh, there was a great miracle that took place. What happened there and the significance?
Look at verse number 32. So Peter was traveling through all these regions. He came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Immediately he got up. Now look at verse 35. And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Think about this miracle. Why is Luke including this miracle? This is maybe one that's kind of overlooked. We know about the, the lame man in Acts chapter 3 and, uh, and maybe even more about Dorcas later on in Acts 9. But what impressed me was that all who lived there, they all turned to the Lord. Isn't that powerful? That the, the, the power of these miracles uh, and, and the impact that they had uh, as the apostles went out preaching the word. And so that's one significant miracle. Then the second one is with the woman named Dorcas in verse number 36. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek also is also called Dorcas, which I think means uh, gazelle. I don't know the significance behind that, but that's what the name means. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. What's our theme for this month in becoming more like Christ? Be what? Be kind, yeah. And so this is what we find with Dorcas. This woman was, was kind. She was a good woman, and she's doing good deeds. And it's just fascinating and amazing how this woman is described, abounding with deeds of kindness. That's what really her life was about in charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died, and when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, Do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. So we understand the significance of these good deeds. We go back to Acts chapter 6 with the needy widows. Uh, widows at this time, they, they would have had nothing if they were widows indeed. And so this woman, Dorcas, uh, is doing so much for, uh, for these widows, and they, they appreciate it, and they're showing Peter, look at all the things that she has done. And so Peter's going to raise her back to life. Verse 40, Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the word. And, and so that's, uh, I'm sorry, in the Lord. So this is a common response, these miracles, to help confirm the word of God. Many are turning to Christ. Uh, we find more and more uh, individuals are being saved. And so uh, Acts chapter 9, obviously the emphasis is upon Paul, but there's also a lot of other great uh, details in here that we need to be familiar with. And what we're going to find, we find this transition into Acts chapter 10. Any questions or comments before we move on to Acts chapter 10? Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. When we see that many believe on the Lord, and especially the Word of God, this is not where, you know, disciples came and they read Acts chapter 8, like we're doing now. Because the New Testament is being unfolded by the spoken word. And this is something that we have to recognize here, that the only Word of God that existed back then was the Old Testament. The going forward, the Word that was being spoken by the mouth of the apostles and the men that were preaching that gospel. So the miracles are attesting at that time the spoken word of the apostles. That's right, yeah. And so and that's why Paul in the synagogues he's refuting and explaining from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ, making that connection. And, and absolutely, the importance of the miracles. Um, I think this goes back to Mark 16, 19, and 20. Um, they had these miracles going about confirming the word of God. And so, yeah, that's what we find. Uh, obviously, things would begin to be written uh, and circulated in the first century with these letters. Uh, that's right, after the fact, yeah. So, again, the power of the word, the power of the miracles. Uh, you know, these miracles, we're reading through this kind of quickly but the miracles are, well, they're amazing. <laughs> they're miracles. And the impact that they're having, I mean, think about, you know, I just read through Tabitha kind of quickly. 
but she's dead, <laughs> all right? And they're showing Peter, look at all the things she's done for us. And, and now she's, she's alive. And, and the same thing with so many other uh, examples that we'll find. And so, uh, excellent point, yeah, uh, the word of God being preached, the miracles uh, connected with all of that. Good. Anyone else? Any other comments, thoughts? Okay, so let's look at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 uh, go hand in hand. Uh, this was the uh, lesson for today. And so uh, lesson uh, number eight. So Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11. Uh, the two words I'm using to refer to these chapters are Gentile conversion, or you could say Cornelius. Acts chapter 11 is really an explanation of Peter or from Peter when he goes back to Jerusalem to tell the people or to tell the Jewish Christians uh, exactly what happened. I had the opportunity to go to Caesarea, Caesarea Maritime. This would have been where, uh, uh, this is Caesarea now, but uh, where we are in Acts chapter 10. And here are just a couple of photos. Um, uh, Herod uh, built up this area uh, going back, obviously, centuries ago. There's a Mediterranean Sea there. And uh, just really powerful and fascinating to see just all the, the architecture that was there. Um, I don't know if you can read this, but it says Pontius Pilate. Uh, Pilate was a Roman prefect who presided over the trial of Jesus of Nazareth. The content of the inscription and the use of the Latin language hint at the level of uh, the Romanization throughout the province and in Caesarea at the beginning of the first uh, century A.D. I believe something else was found there. Um, uh, 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 something very significant with respect to Pontius Pilate as well. Uh, I have some videos. I didn't put them in here, but um, uh, there's. Uh, this is obviously a very historical place of uh, Caesarea. I think this was the the part of um, of, of where Herod built uh, a palace, and there's this pool that would go out into the water, and uh, pretty pretty luxur- luxurious when you look at all the things that he did there. So. When I went over there, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go there. It's just kind of, it's fascinating to put all the connections together. When we're reading these places, and I I know we're going through this quickly, but these are real places, all right? Caesarea, and Joppa, and Lydda, and Jerusalem. Uh, And so it's important for us to to appreciate uh, what's going on. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 10. Let's talk a little bit about Cornelius here. There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion at what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. So the first question was, list the characteristics of Cornelius. What do you guys see in this man named Cornelius? How'd you answer that? He was devout. He certainly feared the Lord. What else? Oh, go ahead. Very open and honest heart, yes. Yeah, it had risen to a place of leadership, absolutely. Um, about, it says in verse 2, a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, seemed to have some influence over his family. I think that's something powerful. Yes, sir. Cornelius was a Gentile, but he seemed to Yet he was not a That's right. That's an excellent. Yeah. Worship their God, and him and his whole family did. It's an unusual uh, Gentile not to be a proselyte. Absolutely, that's a great point, and um, I was going to mention that. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, there seems to be a distinction between a proselyte. We find proselytes in Acts chapter two that uh, these would have been converted to Judaism. And this idea of God-fearing man, we find that language again in Acts 13 uh, and verse 16. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel you and you who fear God. So he was a Gentile. He was not a proselyte. But uh, this idea of being a God-fearing man, I think, is the idea that he would have rejected paganism. Uh, He worshiped the true and living God. Uh, He was not circumcised, obviously, as a Gentile. Uh, and obviously, the second question is, he was in need of salvation, okay? So while he had a lot of great qualities and traits, he's still going to be in need of salvation. Yes, sir. One thing that struck me, too, is, is the, the status and the power that he had there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a very generous man. Uh, great point. There's so many great qualities that he had. And I think even after his conversion, he's going to continue on with these qualities, right? And so, um, so it's interesting. In Acts chapter 10, 
this is really a big deal. We can't really uh, under, uh, over, uh, overstate uh, the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles, the hatred almost that the Jews had, you know, how they viewed the Gentiles as just so, you know, below and wicked and, and rightfully so. I think a lot of the Gentiles would have fallen into that category. But what's going to happen in Acts chapter 10 is a really big deal uh, because you're going to see in Acts chapter 11, remember when Peter, went, Peter and the six men went back to Jerusalem? The people, the Jewish people were upset. Why? Do you remember that when you read Acts 11? He was associating with unclean people, and they emphasized you went into his house. You, went, you ate with him. It's like before you even talked about salvation. You went into the guy's house? I can't believe you did that. So the language in Acts 10 and 11 gives us some indication of there's a clear division, separation between Jews and Gentiles. He was not a proselyte. Excellent. That's right. That's right. Excellent point. Very good. So let's talk a little bit more from Acts 10. Look at verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon. So I think that would have been about 30 miles from Joppa to Caesarea, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and an avowed soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So the function of the angel in this text, what was the function of the angel in this text? How would you guys answer that? Yeah, there's going to be some preparations that are taking place, right? In Acts chapter 8, you kind of, that's part of the question here. Uh, the angel spoke to Philip and said, you go there to that chariot and speak to the eunuch. Uh, again, we find, um, uh, we find an angel of God, and yet this interaction, this teaching that's going to take place is still going to be uh, by man. It's going to be by Peter uh, of all people. So uh, Cornelius is going to have this vision, and a lot of this is going to be rehearsed later on in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. Then Peter, in verse number 9, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. He became, but he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. The sixth hour would have been about noontime. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. What's the significance of this? There's great significance, okay? So there's not a trick question. <laughs> What's the significance of this? Everything created by God is good. Okay, everything created by God is good. All right. What else, though? This is coming to Peter and the vision. What would you say? Yeah, the Jewish dietary laws are done. There's a connection here, and, and this would have been something that Peter would, would have understood. Leviticus chapter 11 gives us details, and I believe Deuteronomy chapter 14, about the dietary restrictions. So the things that he's seen in this vision, these are things that, that's a no-no for Jewish people. I, I can't eat this. I don't touch this. And so this is the response that Peter's going to have. Uh, when the voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. So even after the church has begun, even after the gospel is being preached, Peter, he's still not, he's not touching any of this. Uh, this was something that they did not do uh, as Jews. So what's the point behind all of this, this vision? Um, uh, did Peter understand the meaning and significance of the vision at this time? No, not yet. He's perplexed. He's trying to figure out uh, what's going on. What's the significance of all this? Uh, Joanne, I think you're getting at it there. The, the law. The, the Things that were unclean are now. Okay, and what's that pointing towards? That Gentiles can be accepted into the kingdom of God. You all agree with that? This is a big deal. Now think about this. He has a vision from the angel of the Lord. Someone else is going to talk to him saying, look, it's okay for you to go to the house. Who? Who's going to talk to Peter? It's in the text. Look down. Who? Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit's going to say, Peter, 
go to the house. And this is important. Look at verse number 19. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you, but get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. That is powerful. This is going to be important because even when Peter gets to the house of Cornelius, is he, is he ready to go? Hey, this is fantastic. What's his response even when he gets to the house? What's he say? Look at the text. What's he say? He's apprehensive, yeah. Uh, later on, um, verse 28, thank you. He said to him, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. This is all important as we get to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit baptism and Cornelius and his household speaking in tongues. I want you to see how much was necessary just to get Peter and these Jewish men to move just to get to the house of Cornelius. So there's a lot of unique events that are taking place. The angel of God uh, speaking to Cornelius, uh, Peter having this vision here, the Holy Spirit now speaking to Peter. So this is what we're looking at here, uh, this idea of Gentile conversion. Um, uh, we know that Cornelius was a moral man. Uh, the angel of God is going to speak to him. Uh, the vision on the housetop. Anyone want to add anything? Go ahead. Absolutely, yeah, great points. And Acts 11 and verse 19, adding to what you said there, it says, so then, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution, which goes back to Acts chapter 8, that occurred in connection with Stephen, made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. So, this, yeah, this is a really big deal what's taking place here in Acts chapter 10. And there is some necessary inference taking place here. He's got to figure out what's going on here. So, uh, Peter and these Jewish men, they go to the, to the house of Cornelius. Uh, the next section, it talks about the arrival of, uh, of these messengers in verse 17 through 23. And, uh, and we see that uh, the Holy Spirit had to let Peter know, look, you need to go there. Don't worry about this. So Peter and, his, uh, and the, men that, the Jewish men that he's going to have or take with him, uh, they go to, now to the house of uh, Cornelius. So this meeting is going to take place here. Uh, Look at verse number 23. We can't read all 20 of these verses. So he invited them and gave them lodging. And on the next day, he got up and went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he had called together his relatives and close friends. I love that. You see what he did? He's talking to his family, talking to his friends. He didn't have any invite cards. You don't really need those. He's talking, though, right? There's something there. Man, this guy, he's got, it. he's got it. You guys need to hear the word of God. The apostles come. You need to hear what he's got to say. We've got to move fast. Go ahead. One question about just that. Okay. Jews did not even take Paul, uh, take Cornelius, and Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is impressive. How come you didn't talk to him about that? Well, that's what we saw in Acts 11. They only they only went to the Jews only. Look, this is a this is a, a shift that's taken place uh, mentally. Gentiles can be a part of the the kingdom of God. Great point for us though with Cornelius. All the family at service, right? All the family, all right? Let's bring all the family here, and let's talk to our family. So Cornelius, he, he um, verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshiped him. No, don't do that. But Peter raised him up, saying, stand up. I, too, am just a man. These apostles were men just like everyone else. You don't worship man. You worship God. As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. Maybe Peter was, he was probably surprised too. Like, man, what is going on here? Got the, whole, the whole house is packed. So we just read verse number 28. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who's a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. 
And yet, because, and yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without raising any objection when I was sent for. So I ask for what reason you have sent for me. So uh, verse 28, you can make a, a line going back to that vision that Peter had. Um, yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. So it's making that connection there uh, with that vision. And so what, uh, what Cornelius is going to do, he's going to rehearse his story uh, to Peter and to the men. In verse number 33, so I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before, the, before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. This is very important because Cornelius and his household are going to have to hear words by which to be saved, okay? This is important to make sure we have a good understanding about exactly how and when Cornelius and his family were saved. So opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Gentiles could be saved, but if they're going to be saved, they would have to be saved by following and obeying the gospel message. Jews could be saved, but if they were going to be saved, they would have to come to follow Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and obey the gospel as well. And so what Peter's going to do, he's going to uh, well, he's going to, uh, to preach uh, the message. Uh, and so when you go look back in the workbook here, uh, was Peter's message, number nine, to the Gentiles basically different from his message to the Jews? Was it different? It wasn't different. He's, he's preaching the same gospel. I think maybe the author is just trying to make the point. You preach the same gospel. It doesn't matter who the audience is. All right? You preach the same thing, message to the Jews, to the Gentiles, to kings, to a man who is lame, whatever the case may be, you preach the same mes- message. Yes, sir. Say that the uh, this is a good example to me of how the approach to preaching the gospel, the gospel message is the same, but the approach may be uh, a little different based on the audience. And sure. Chapter two that, that uh, Peter refers back to Old Testament prophecies of Christ and the things that the Jews would be familiar with, whereas here he starts out. Absolutely, yeah. They preach the same message, same gospel. The approach may be a little bit different, right? Um, Acts 16 with the uh, Philippian jailer. He had to start at the very beginning. You know, he had to hear some basic facts about Christ. Yeah, so uh, that's exactly right. Uh, understanding the audience, uh, the overarching theme, you know, we, we keep the same message, the same gospel. So, Oh, go ahead. I didn't see you. Yeah, we're Gentiles. Unless we're Jewish, we're Gentiles, right? <laughs> and so it's a blessing that we that, that we are a part of the kingdom of God. That's right. Yes, ma'am. That's a great point. Yeah, God is willing to accept all who meet, who meet the conditions, right, who fear him. And to add on to what you said, go to Acts chapter 11. We're just going to kind of go back and forth here. In Acts chapter 11, and look at verse number 18. This is back after Peter and the, and the Jews went back to Jerusalem. Uh, it says, when they heard this, the conversion of uh, Cornelius, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God is granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. So that's a great point. Repentance is necessary. Yeah, God will accept all men, but there's going to have to be some change, right? Uh, and repentance is going to be key. Uh, same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost. Repentance was necessary. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So uh, Peter and the Jews that go to the house of Cornelius, uh, now in verses 44 through 48, and I want to see, we've got to get this done today. I want to make sure we understand what's going on. Look at verse number uh, 42. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. 
Of him all the prophets bear witness, it sounds like Acts 3, that through his name everyone who believes in him believes, encompasses everything that one is to do, receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God, And Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. I wish we had more detail about verse number 48, what that looked like, staying at his house, but we don't. Now, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. How was Cornelius saved? This is important. Because sometimes there can be some misunderstanding, okay? So how was Cornelius saved? There are some common answers that are wrong. Number one, sometimes people may think, well, he said the sinner's prayer to be saved. Well, he certainly was a praying man, but he was not saved by saying any type of sinner's prayer, okay? Uh, So Cornelius is going to be saved the same way everyone else was. He believed and was baptized. That's the right answer, okay? A, a, A second common answer that is often or may often be given or sometimes can have a misunderstanding Uh, He received the Holy Spirit to be saved. Now, Holy Spirit baptism took place, right? He's going to be speaking in tongues. His family, we see that. We don't deny that. That's what the Holy Spirit recorded right here. Peter speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Uh, But he was not saved at that point. Are we all in agreement with that? And if we're not, ask me some questions. I'd love to study more with you about that. Hold on one second. He believed and was baptized. This is important to understand, and let me just share something else here real quickly here, that when Cornelius, um, when, he spoke in t- when he spoke in tongues, uh, sometimes people say, well, you know, you need to speak in tongues to show you've been saved. That's not what's happening here. Uh, and he was not saved when he was speaking in tongues. What's gonna, what we find here is that Cornelius and his household, they would do the exact same thing that everyone else did in the first century, Uh, to be saved. They had to believe in Christ and they had to be baptized. Now, what's the significance? We only have a couple minutes. What's the significance of this of this event that's taking place? Peter's talking. Holy Spirit fell upon them. They began speaking in tongues. What's the significance of that? Real quickly, what's the why is that significant? Okay, it's demonstrating that these Gentiles can be accepted just as the Jews were. I believe that's the the right answer. Now, verse number 45, all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. And so I think all of this was taking place to demonstrate to the Jewish people uh, that, listen, these uh, Gentiles can be accepted into the kingdom of God. And the language that Peter used I think is demonstrating this. Uh, they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Remember, tongues is not, was not some gibber jash, right? It was a language, and maybe they were speaking in a Jewish language that the people understood. Go ahead. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, That's right. This was done to demonstrate they could be saved. No question about it. They could be accepted. The tongue speaking, that was going to be a sign for those Jewish for those Jewish men. And I think that's why Peter says in uh, verse number 47, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What Peter's doing here, I want to make sure this is clear. He's not teaching anything different, guys. He's not teaching anything different from Acts chapter 2, from Acts chapter 3, with respect to salvation. Now, something unique did happen here, and there was a purpose uh, behind it. Uh, Vicki, I don't want you to think I was ignoring you. Do you have a comment real quickly? Sure. Yeah, and he's going to order them to to be baptized. And so that's what he's going to do in Acts chapter 11. He's going to rehearse these events, and he's going to show them in Acts 15 when there is that problem in uh, Jerusalem about did the Gentiles need to be circumcised, he goes back to this event. So I want to make sure that's clear. Uh, any, com- any questions about that? We only have a couple seconds left. Go ahead. They didn't believe. The Jews themselves didn't believe that when the Holy Spirit That's why it was It's a great that's a great point. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Excellent point. So um, 
we'll uh, we'll pick up here next week. Uh, look at lesson number nine, and we'll wrap up Acts chapter eleven. Acts chapter eleven is is a lot of it's a rehearsal of Acts ten. Uh, there's a couple of thoughts I want to mention in the latter part. Uh, so uh, be prepared to talk about lesson number nine, which is uh, Acts chapter. Let's see here. What is this? Acts chapter. It looks like Acts chapter thirteen and fourteen. All right. Thank you, guys.